So, Australian Survivor, eh? It's no secret that I'm not the biggest supporter of Australian Survivor in the world. It has its good seasons, it has its good characters, and at the end of the day, it is Survivor, but there's just so many weird things going on with it, and I feel like the things that people bring up when saying that it's better than Survivor US are things that I don't necessarily agree with. But with that said, I don't hate it either, and we just got a new season, Heroes vs Villains, which I actually thought was pretty solid and one of the better seasons of the series. Now it has its issues, and I don't think it fixes all of the problems as some people claim, but I had a lot of fun watching it and I feel like there's enough things going for it to where I can say that it is a good season of the show. Now as usual with my reviews, I like to divide them up into four sections, one talking about the cast, another about the production, another about the editing, and one for the gameplay. But let's not waste any more time, let's get into it. So first up you have the cast, which despite it being heroes versus villains, and you would think that would mean the biggest heroes and villains from past seasons, no, they decided to go with a half and half approach. And not even half and half, it's 13 newbies versus only 11 returnees, meaning that over half the cast are blank slates that you're just labeling as being heroes or villains before they even get to play. And yes, while you base a lot of that off their occupation or whatever character they come off in in their interviews and promos and stuff, you still have plenty of uh, questionable decisions. And speaking of questionable, you have these returnees, many of which are not necessarily your first picks. Now obviously you have your big names, you have your Georges, your Haley's, your Shawnee's, all of which you would expect, but then you have Jackie from Champions vs Contenders, you have Sam Webb from 2016, you have Sean from Champions vs Contenders 2, and then the biggest one of all, Steve from Champions vs Contenders the sneakiest player in Survivor history. Sure, I guess. Now obviously you could tell that they tried to get an all-star season together only for that to not come through, but still you have these interesting players and let's just go through each of them in their boot order. So first up you have Jackie who I really felt bad for, where despite her being one of the more questionable choices, I feel like she was one of the bigger fans and I felt like that she could have been interesting on the return but then she gets taken out due to production incompetence, which I'll talk about more in the next section. Then you have Anjali, who is just kind of there. I didn't really care too much for her. Michael was a little fun, I guess, but again, just sort of flamed out at the beginning. Mimi was just kind of there. I didn't care too much for her. Then we have Rogue, who I was not prepared for at all. Again, one of the worst players in Australian Survivor, if not all of Survivor, it's just awesome. Then we have Sarah, who was mostly there, got a pretty small edit, all things considered. Then we have Frazier, who was there. Then we have Sharni, my winner pick of the season, and uh, not quite what I was expecting. I felt like she was going to be this bigger player, but instead she was kind of annoying with how much she talked about honor and integrity. But then we move on to the biggest hero of the season, Paige. Yeah, that aged well. And then we have Jordy, who did kind of surprise me, as I felt like he was just going to flame at the beginning, I felt like he was going to have such a big target on his back, but instead he actually played alright for a lot of it. Now granted, he eventually got caught, and to a degree it was his own fault, but I still found him to be an interesting character on the season. Then we have Benjamin, who I was kind of high on the preseason, but I felt like he just largely underwhelmed me, and I felt like he got one of the worst case scenarios for the type of player that I thought he was going to be, so uh, there's that. Then we got the one and only Stevie, where all means aside, he was okay. I mean, he got some moments here or there, but I felt like that was rooting for him more so because of how ridiculous it would be for someone like him to be like a top contender. But again, he made it relatively far, definitely further than I was expecting, but he was obviously taken out. Then we get to the merge boo in David, who I was not expecting to be the most under edited character of the season, where he literally has one confessional across the entire season, despite lasting 13 episodes. And considering he is this professional athlete, you would think that he wouldn't be purpled so much, but he was. So uh, that did surprise me, although he was a good player, I'll give him that. Then we get Flick, who was fine. I felt like it was interesting seeing her play from the bottom post swap and her getting Shawnee and Liz to want to save her, but aside from that, I felt like she didn't do too much to change my view of her. 
Then we have Sam, who is definitely a fun narrator for a lot of the pre-merge. I didn't think he played the best game in the world, but you know, like he was welcome to a degree. Then we have Shawnee, who is the Rob goddess of the season, and she was pretty good. I mean, she is Shawnee at the end of the day, a pretty strong villain, and played a pretty good game for the most part, but uh, she got sniped at the final nine, and she didn't even get the serve on the jury, so uh, I know a lot of people are pretty upset for their queen here. Then we have Sean, who was there for the most part. He obviously was a pretty big character, and I know a lot of people saw him as a top contender, but I felt like he was mostly fine. I didn't care too much for him, but he played a pretty good game. Then we have Haley, who kind of underwhelmed me. Now, at the end of the day, I didn't think she was going to win, given that she was his former winner, and I felt like by the end, the edit just wasn't there with how inconsistent it was. However, I am glad she made it as far as she did, and she definitely has cemented her place as one of the best Australian Survivor players out there. And then we get to Simon. Oh boy. I love Simon on this season. He was probably one of my favorite characters. Just seeing him just try and fail over and over again was just really funny to me. And you could tell that he really wanted it more than anything else. And at the end of the day, I'm glad that he got as far as he did. It would have been devastating if he got removed from the jury, but I'm kind of glad that he got so far. And it's crazy that he was actually a jury favorite by the end, which is also really funny, but really glad he was on this season. Then we get to Nina, who I'm not gonna lie, also underwhelmed me. I felt like given just how big of a character she seemed coming into the season, that I felt like she would have gotten a bit more screen time. However, she kind of underwhelmed me as well with how inconsistent it was during the pre-merge. And yeah, while she got some good content here and there, it really wasn't enough to make her a top contender for me at any point, which is the same considering how far she made it. Then we get to George, which I'm really happy George did very well in this season. Again, similar to Jordy, I was very worried that he could have been a pre-merge target given, well, Brains vs. Braun, but he repeated his game more or less, where he dominated a lot of it, was able to get one up on Shawnee, get one up on Haley, and come relatively close to winning the game, but obviously he just can't win a challenge to save his life. But I'm glad we got to see George again. He kind of reminds me of Dr. Will from Big Brother when we saw him come back for PV All-Stars and did very well there. And I feel like he will go down as one of the best Australian Survivor players, but he didn't win at the end. Then we get to the final three. I mean, Jerry was interesting to a degree. Now he did get pretty good content early on, but I just didn't care much for him. And plus with the drought in content he got in the post-merge, I feel like it was very clear that he was just gonna be dragged to the end as a losing finalist, so uh, there's that. And we have Matt, who I remember not feeling that great about him. I felt like I had him high in my preseason ranking because he just seemed naturally well-liked to where he would do well regardless of how aggressive he was playing. And he had a solid premiere and then nothing else to where he, yeah, he was probably gonna lose at the end, but still interesting that he got as far as he did. And then we have the winner in Liz, who was okay from a TV standpoint, although I'm not gonna lie, of the people who made the end game, she was probably the person that I least wanted to win from a personal rooting standpoint, as I felt like my ideal scenario would have been either a George win or a Simon win, although outside of that, I would have liked Nina win as well. You know, like, and even a Matt win would have been okay, I guess. I feel like Liz is probably the most underwhelming from an entertainment standpoint, Although from a story standpoint, it makes all the sense in the world given her edit, but again, we'll talk about that more in a moment. So all things considered, I actually find this cast to be pretty alright for the most part, definitely in line with what you expect from an Australian Survivor season, and despite how screwy it was with it being broken down by newbies and returnees, I actually felt like the season actually turned out pretty alright in that regard. I feel like the production is probably the weakest part of really any Australian Survivor season, where I feel like more often than not they make some really bizarre decisions in terms of what to do. Some work out, some don't, but I feel like there's plenty of issues you can take with even the good things. And I feel like this season isn't too much different, where first up, again, the whole concept of it being heroes versus villains is a bit ridiculous, especially when you have these returning players alongside newbies who, again, we have no read on them, and it led to some weird stuff with some of the hero newbies not really playing like heroes and vice versa. It's just kind of a mess when you do it that way. But even aside from that, I think there were a few things that really called into question a lot of what production was doing during the season. 
I think the biggest thing was the whole decision of the cookie idol, like basically production planning a fake idol, which I didn't really like at all. I feel like the main appeal of a fake idol is it gives the players creativity. It gives them agency to come up with a way of tricking their opposition into a false sense of security. And I think it's the players themselves that really propel that into what it is. But I feel like when you allow production to just put in a fake idol by default, it does two things. One is that it creates this unnecessary drama that really screws over a player in the long term, really not due to anything that players are doing, but because of what production is doing. And I think the other thing is that it undermines trust in production from the players, where obviously the players are looking to production to provide them with accurate information about what twists can do, what the rules are, and so on and so forth. But when you have a fake idol that's planted by production, you're basically having production lie to the players, which again makes them question like what the rules are, what they can do, and what they can't do. And when the players don't trust production, that leads to less interesting confessionals, like players don't feel comfortable sharing their thoughts on the game with them for fear that they could be leaked. There's concern that they may not play advantages correctly or to the best of their ability because they may not rely on them as reliable means of furthering their gains due to potential lies that production may share. So I think to that end, lying to the players about certain things like a fake idol can really undermine the overall product in the long term. Now the one saving grace to all this is that at least they didn't give them like a fake note saying that this was a real idol, they just gave an idol with no clue, and we saw Benjamin be able to deduce that it wasn't a real idol because there was no note attached. So I think to that end, it doesn't make it as bad, though considering that we are seeing a similar twist happening on Survivor 44, it makes me worried that we could start to see more of these fake production idols in the future that could really muck things up. But aside from that, you have nothing too egregious on the twist end. I mean, you have the dumb non-elimination twists, you have the mutiny, you have the juror removal. Nothing too out of line with Australian Survivor. However, I do think there are a couple of incidents that really highlight shortcomings on the production team's part. First up, you have this first immunity challenge that was clearly unsafe and resulted in Jackie getting medevaced and could have resulted in George being medevaced as well. Like, production clearly should have known that this challenge was unsafe and that they probably should have gone with something else. And you can even see in the episode that Jackie, like, was hesitating as she was running towards that obstacle. So even she could tell that this was not going to be a very safe landing. Also, just imagine if both Jackie and George were medevaced right at the beginning. Like, what would they have done in this case? How underwhelming would it have been to lose George right at the beginning due to production incompetence? And considering that something similar happened just a couple seasons ago with Ross from Champions vs Contenders 2, you'd think they would have learned their lesson by now, but clearly not. And I think the other notable incident is when Rogue was talking to Nina early on, and Rogue said some pretty insensitive stuff to Nina, and I felt like the fact that production didn't make a bigger deal out of this, like, is another shortcoming. Like, you could clearly tell that Nina was uncomfortable by all this, but the fact that production didn't really do more to reprimand Nina for this type of behavior is pretty bad as well, and I think highlights ways in which production can improve in the future. But even with these things, I feel like the overall quality of production is pretty similar to that of other seasons of Australian Survivor, where there are some good things about them, but there are plenty of things that can be improved on in future seasons. Then we get to the fun part, the editing. So it's no secret that Australian Survivor has a uh, certain editing style, where over the last couple seasons we have had incredibly obvious winner edits. Where last season we had Blood vs. Water, where I called out Mark from very early on. He was literally number three in my power ranking week one, and then was pretty much number one pretty much every other week afterwards. Then we get the Brains vs. Braun, where Haley was the very clear frontrunner from episode seven on, and even though she was literally voted out in the post merge, I felt like she was just gonna come back into the game and win, which is pretty funny there. Then we get to All Stars, where David was pretty much the frontrunner from the merge onwards. And even going back to Champion vs. Contenders 2, we have Pia, who was a very notable contender from early on as well. So, obviously Australian Survivor has this issue where the seasons become very predictable and it seems like everyone outside the winner and a couple of other big characters just aren't that big of a focus. But with all that said, I think it's pretty safe to say that this season was 
a change of pace in terms of how things were edited where the winner was not as clear to any stretch of the imagination and it took a while for people to come around to see who the true winner was where I saw a number of people shift between Sean and Jordy for a lot of the season. I mean, heck, you saw it on my power rankings where I went back and forth over who the winner would be. Although by the merge, I was pretty confident that it was going to be a Spice Girl. It was just a matter of whether it was going to be George, Liz, or Shawnee. And once Shawnee went, I had it down to George or Liz. And admittedly, I did go back and forth a lot, even in the end game. Now, I did have Liz at number one for a decent amount of those end game stretches. But similar to Survivor 43, I went with the final juror being number one in my last power ranking. And I'm sure that's what everyone's going to remember me for. But even outside of that, you have all these other top contenders that were definitely in consideration. Although, I mean, it was pretty clear that they weren't going to win by the end of it. Although I'm not going to lie, I think it's a bit overstated just how different the editing was in comparison to other seasons, where despite the winner being unclear for a lot of it, I still think the season was unbalanced in a lot of ways, where it had all those issues of players just not getting as much content. I mean, hi David. But even aside from that, you have George, who ended the season with 155 confessionals, while the winner only had 42. The 4th place finisher of the season had more confessionals than the final 3 combined, which is insane to think about, but that's Australian Survivor for you. I mean, but even outside of that, you have plenty of under-edited characters as well. You have people like a Frasier. Who's that again? You have Jackie, who had zero confessionals as well. You have all these players that just didn't get nearly enough content, and it was very easy to write them off early on. And let's just talk about the winner in Liz, who had a very interesting winner's edit in comparison to these other seasons, where she literally had zero confessionals in the first episode, and only had one confessional in all of week one, which is pretty insane to think about. She was the type of player that, despite not getting many confessionals across the season, where I believe she only had 42 by the end of it, she was very present early on, and she was pretty much included as being a Spice Girl and we saw a lot of content of her around camp without her actually saying stuff in the confessional booth. But she did get spikes in content later on, particularly when she was on the outs on the Swap Tribe, where she got the talk about being an underdog. And even beyond that, she got plenty of focus after Shawnee was blindsided, where she talked about how she was going to bide her time until George was going to be cut by her. And sure enough, she does get credit for cutting George at the very end, which is a big reason why she wins in a unanimous jury vote. But I think it took so long for people to come around to Liz simply because her edit was not in line with that of a Mark or even a Haley from Brains vs. Braun, where you had all these other players that seemed poised to win based on their edits, people like a Jordy, for instance, that just got cut along the way. And even George was someone I was very back and forth on, where he definitely got a lot of content, like, and even more so than I would feel comfortable with, even knowing that Australian Survivor likes to give a lot of content to its big players, but he still managed to get all the way to the end of the game, and it made me think that maybe he could pull it out by the end of it. George just does that to a lot of people, but in the end, Liz was the one to take him out and get all the credit for it. So I think to that end, Liz's edit makes sense here, and it would be interesting to see if future winners of Australian Survivor are edited like this, or if they're just going to go back to what they were doing before. So all in all, I think the editing was definitely one of the more pleasant surprises from this season, where I had a lot of fun tracking who was going to win from week to week and trying to narrow it down, all the while seeing like these more conventional winner edits being taken down as the players are leaving the game until there was just Liz left. So at the end of the day, I still find the editing to be flawed in terms of it being unbalanced, but it was still fun to follow the actual edgic. And finally, let's talk about the gameplay. Now, I already made a full on player ranking where I go through the ins and outs of each player's game, so you can check that out. But in general, I find this to be an improvement over Blood vs. Water, or at least how it was presented on the show. Now, I think there are more highs in this season compared to Blood vs. Water, like you have the craziest tribal ever, where I did criticize it for being reliant on a twist to make it as interesting as it was, but it was still a fantastic moment for George, both from a gameplay standpoint and from an entertainment standpoint. 
you also have things like the David Tribal, which was pretty fun. You have some fun idol plays as well. The Shawnee blind side is also a lot of fun. You have all these interesting turns along the way. Although I'm not gonna lie, it was mostly a dominant game run by the Spice Girls for a lot of it. Where early on you had them pretty much running the game, I feel like there was never a point where their power was in question per se, and especially not after that swap where they basically had the majority from that point. And at the merge, they were able to get the numbers again over the original heroes, and they kind of just begonged them for a lot of it. Now yes, it is interrupted by the Shawnee vote, but still we are seeing all these heroes being taken out until we get to the final four, where it is two of the Spice Girls and two of the heroes that they have flipped over from much earlier in the game. So in terms of the power flipping, there aren't too many full-on power shifts that happen, but I'm not gonna lie, considering that I like George and Liz a lot in the Spice Girls as characters, I will admit that this was a satisfying outcome for the season. Now, again, I would have liked it to be a bit more dynamic and I wish there was more of a serious opposition to George. However, at the end of the day, I can't say the gameplay here is bad and I do find it to be more enjoyable to watch over the likes of Blood vs. Water. And let's talk about Liz who definitely had an interesting winning game. Now, at the end of the day, I feel like she's more in line with the second command game where she didn't really control a lot of the votes. I felt like Shawnee and George were controlling what their alliance was doing for a lot of it, but she managed to stay in the majority for a lot of the game. Now, yes, she does get a pretty bad swap, but she's able to work that into her favor, especially once we see Nina and Sam and David pull her into their alliance. And plus she's able to survive the vote over Jordy, but that, a lot of that's because she was a smaller threat. But she's able to get to the merge and from that point on she's able to ride the wave for a bit. And after Shawnee goes, she's able to sort of follow George along, keep George around as a shield. Now granted, I think George had a lot more control over the game and I feel like George would have beat her in a jury vote had they gotten to the end together. But she also knew that she needed to cut George by the end in order to win. And she's able to do that by winning final immunity. Now, I do falter to a degree by her positioning by the Final Four, where despite her building this alliance with Nina and George to where she had at least somewhat of a power structure in the endgame, that gets flipped on when George, who was in a better position, flipped the game against Nina and made it so that Liz was basically at the bottom and needed to win that Final Four immunity challenge, which she does. And I do give her some credit for cutting George and winning in a unanimous jury vote, now again, I think she's more of a second command winner at the end of the day, so I can't really have her too, too high in a winner ranking, but I still find her game overall to be somewhat impressive. So on the whole, I did find the gameplay here to be pretty good for the most part, and definitely more enjoyable to watch than something like a Blood vs. Water. Although if we are looking at the grand scale of it, I do feel like there are a lot of similarities in the sense that there isn't that many power shifts and really the dominant alliance from the beginning tended to maintain control throughout the game. So overall, I found this season to be a massive improvement over Blood vs. Water. Now, I still think there are plenty of similarities you can draw between them in terms of how the game played out. However, I feel like the cast was a bit stronger than Blood vs. Water, and I feel like there are more fun moments within that season that really elevate my overall enjoyment, to where this is one of the better seasons of Australian Survivor. I also think the editing really helped the season as well to keep it relatively engaging for a lot of it. Like it wasn't just a boring, predictable winner where you just waited until the end for them to be coronated. But still, I still think there are some lingering issues with Australian Survivor that need to be rectified, namely the unbalanced editing for one, like you can't just give people zero confessionals the whole season. And I also think that production can be improved to a degree, I think there are some things that production can learn so that future seasons can be better on the whole, like thinking through your twists all the way and making sure that your contestants aren't being like racist or anything. But all things considered, I find this to be a strong improvement over Blood vs. Water and one of the best seasons in Australian Survivor. And there we go, that will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out with the channel. Now, now that I'm done with Australian Survivor, I'm covering Survivor 44, so you can expect weekly coverage of that. I'm also covering Big Brother Canada right now, so you can expect future coverage of that as well. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord server, which you can join by clicking the link in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way, but for now, that's the video. See ya.